Thanks, Wendy, and uh, nice talking to all of you guys today. Thanks for having me on the phone. Um, so I've been working with Jeremy for several years on tracks related efforts here in Northern California, and um, just this year I started working with him on his Trex program more broadly, which has been really exciting for me. And um, Jeremy asked me to give an intro to Trex before he dives into some of the lessons learned from the 40 or so Trexes that he's implemented over the years. Um, we weren't really sure what the level of familiarity is within this group. Um, I'm sure that most of you have heard of Trex and know generally what it is. And some of you have probably participated in Trex events and others may have even hosted or organized Trexes in your area. But I think it'll be useful just to get us all on the same page before Jeremy kind of gets into the meteor content of this presentation. So I'm going to start us off with just a few intro slides um, and then discuss a little bit the NorCal treks that I organize here in Northern California um, before turning it over to Jeremy. So Liz, you can go ahead and change the slide. So TREX, what is it? Um, so TREX, like Wendy said, stands for Prescribed Fire Training Exchange, and it's really an innovative training model. Um, it includes diverse participants. So we bring people from, you know, like I have listed here on the slide, we have federal, state, private, tribal, academic, um, non-governmental, participants from all different backgrounds. And that's really one of the, the strengths of the TREX model is this diversity of participation. And um, we bring all those people together and build a fully functional burn team that has every level of experience represented. So we have people who have never held a drip torch, and we have people who have been working in fire for 30 years. Um, and from a qualifications perspective, that means we have, you know, people who are firefighter twos, and we have people who are, are burn bosses, burn boss trainees, and everything in between. So we really are able to build this fully functional team um, that can go to any host unit and conduct a prescribed burn um, and work with local hosts to accomplish these objectives on the ground while also getting a quality training experience. Um, some of you may be thinking, oh, this sounds really similar to the PFTC model in the southeast or some other types of trainings, um, you know, prescribed fire trainings like this, but there are some unique aspects of TREX that really set it apart, and uh, you can advance the slide. So the TREX model really takes a holistic approach. Um, it's not just, you know, there aren't just skills on the fire line that we're learning, though of course we have a lot of those and it's really a hands-on model. But we also have, we really get at the larger social, political, ecological context and emphasize um, not only the fire line based skills, but also media and communication skills, fire ecology and effects, leadership, collaboration and networks, um, those are all important aspects of the training model. And there are different ways that we bring those into the events. So typically, um, a TREX is about a two-week event, and people come from all over, spend those two weeks in this intense training scenario where they're out on, you know, out conducting prescribed burns when they can, when the windows are right, and then spending their downtime learning from each other and um, and learning about local ecology and policy. And it's just really a neat, um, unique experience that I think really sets it apart from other types of fire trainings. Um, and one thing I didn't put here that I think is important to mention is that the TREX model, um, although all the participants have to have basic NWCG qualifications just to participate. We, we're, we really emphasize that and make sure that everyone has basic qualification level. But we really also value different forms of knowledge and experience, and um, I think that's also an important part of this model. We, you know, if we have academics there, we really make sure that they're sharing some of the research that they're working on. And if we have tribal participants, we make sure that their um, experiences and their forms of knowledge are valued. So it's really an exciting model that resonates with a broad spectrum of people. Um, change the slide, please. So how is it organized? Um, I talked a little bit about the fact that everyone has to have basic qualifications just to participate, and that's really to make sure we're all you know, on the same page and that everyone has, has the skills they need to be safe and to participate fully. Um, we do organize it as an incident, so we haven't typically have an incident management team that includes um, an incident commander and other, you know, plan section chief and 
operations section chief. So it was very structured and well organized. And I think that's necessary when you're bringing people together who don't know each other and haven't worked together. It's really important to have a, a strong structure and organization. Um, we also have the, the, there's kind of a premise that participants are both trainers and trainees. So if you come in and you're qualified as a, um, as a burn boss, for instance, you're, you will be training someone um, under you, but you'll also be learning new skills from people who have more qualifications than you do. And that's really the exchange part of um, the TREX model is this, this trainer and trainee dual position for every single person that's out there. Even the person who is you know, a firefighter to trainee <laughs> um, has something to offer. And um, you can advance to the next slide. So this really gets at some of these core philosophies of TREX, which is that diverse participation really engenders a rich learning environment for everyone. And everyone has something to teach and something to learn, no matter what your skill base and what your qualifications are. Um, and really, the TREX model increases capacity at multiple levels. So not only is it providing burn crews, really, for local burn programs to get more done on the ground, but also developing regional networks of burners who have new qualifications and new capacities to get more work done um, within a certain region. And then also building these national and international networks of practitioners who can you know, start new projects and be thinking of new ways to collaborate and new ways to um, increase our collective capacity to, to use fire. So it's really, I mean, I personally, it's just a really exciting model and I love working with Jeremy on this. Um, so the next slide, um, I, so this year we're planning our third um, Northern California treks here where I live, and that'll be in October. And um, so we've had the last two years, we've, we've held it as well, and we typically include about 35 participants, and we bring them from all over the place. We've had people from um, all over the country as well as out of the country, and um, we we typically burn on federal and private lands throughout the region, so we move around. Um, we typically set up three different incident command posts throughout the region during the two-week event. And the reason we do that is really for geographic diversity. So in our area, we have very narrow burn windows, and um, the more geographic diversity you can build into your training, the more flexibility you have when the time comes. So it's really hard to choose that two-week window when you say, oh, this is going to be the, you know, the perfect time for a trek, but there's no way to, to do that and to really know that that's going to be the best time. But if you can build in geographic diversity, build in diversity of burn units and ecosystem types and fuel types, it really gives you a lot more flexibility. So we, um, we emphasize that here for our treks. And in our region, it's really bolstered local capacity and, and enhanced networks um, at multiple scales. We have a prescribed fire council here that's, that's heavily engaged in the treks and, and hosts it. And um, we also have more local level organizations that, that really benefit from the treks model. So um, that's just kind of an example. I don't know if anyone has any questions for me, but I will hand it off to, to Jeremy to get into some of more of the lessons learned. So feel free to, to throw questions in the chat box. And uh, Jeremy, go ahead. Thanks, Lania. And uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. I always enjoy your um, team calls. They're full of good stuff. Uh, so this is the first time I've tried to talk about the lessons that we've learned from training exchanges applied to a broader context of cooperative burning where it's just neighbors helping neighbors burning. Um, the, the training exchanges are definitely following an adaptive management model, and an, an example would be about three years ago, we really recognized that our incident management teams needed to have a training officer embedded in them. Previously, we were just running um, plans and ops and uh, an incident commander, and then burn bosses working for the, the team. And then and several years ago, we. We really um, recognized that we needed to have a training officer dedicated to making sure all the um, training was getting documented appropriately. And, and, uh, and then over the next couple of years after that, we um, started working on how that training officer was, was formatted and what kind of documentation they were using. We developed a couple of spreadsheets. And then those spreadsheets, um, you know, tracking sheets basically got 
uh, passed along to the different training officers we were engaging with, and they kept getting modified and improved until finally we landed upon a, a spreadsheet genius who um, really modified our model. We had to reel them in a little bit. And, uh, and we ended up with the product that we're using now. So I think the training exchanges are following this really excellent adaptive management model where we're learning from every two-week event we host. But that's not what I wanted to talk about today. What I wanted to talk about today were these um, lessons learned that apply more broadly. And so um, I think following up on the definition of the training exchange that uh, Lania provided as it pertains to what I'm about to talk about, I think these training exchanges are highly condensed versions of an integrated fire management program that take a holistic approach, use collaboration, coordination, and cooperation during planning and implementation. And um, these lessons, the following lessons learned, I hope apply to just general um, neighbor helping neighbor kind of practices that we might be engaging in out there. Next slide. The, uh, the number one lesson we've learned in these 40 past training exchanges is people who want fire, you know, can get fire. And, um, and so I, I really believe that if you're dedicated enough to achieve, you can achieve your um, desired fire on the ground. And so I, I know that all of us can very quickly write a list of five to ten barriers to implementing controlled burns or prescribed fires. Uh, and, um, and, and what we're learning is that all of those can be overcome um, given, uh, you know, work and collaboration with your neighbors. Starting the process, knowing that there is risk involved is really important. Um, you're not going to get away from risk. It's not going to be a free ride implementing fire on the ground. And, um, you know, leaders are going to have to take on that risk. Now, along with that, we have to mitigate the risk as much as possible. And what we're learning is that um, the way agencies and organizations and individuals and landowners are mitigating their risk are through simple agreements like memorandums of understanding, uh, participating agreements, fire management agreements, contracts, liability waivers. These are the kinds of paperwork that are um, mitigating the liability in a way where the managers are willing to take on the risk. I think there's other ways to mitigate liability that um, the practitioners in the room would, you know, would maybe steer towards, which is appropriate burn plans, prescriptions, uh, seasonality, ecology, or, you know, the communities that are in support of and those sorts of things that mitigate the actual risk of an escape or other. Next slide. Don't try to stay under the radar. I think a lot of our prescribed fire programs around the country try to stay as quiet as possible and not attract attention because um, they don't want to get shut down. They don't want to. They don't want negative attention. And I think that's um, helped us succeed in small ways and, and maybe get an underground program going that's putting smoke up in the back 40. But as we move to the front 40, as we move to community protection. Um, you know, there's no way that we can do our job under um, under the radar. And so I, I think we just need to be bold and brave and engage everybody who's going to see our smoke, which, um, you know, the next statement I think is important, too, is that working with the media has, uh, has been really productive for our teams. We're, we're inviting the media to join us on multiple days of burning, in some cases, we've embedded reporters for two weeks at a time during our training exchanges. And, and um, working with the media comes with challenges. They, uh, they, they work different hours than us. They have different time frames than us. And so you really have to have dedicated staff who are going to go and work with the media and who can arrange their daily schedules and transportation routes and meeting locations and safety briefings around the media so that they can get the good story they want and they can relate that story out to the community. Um, air quality regulations is also mentioned as a barrier among many practitioners and, and managers. And I think that um, we're seeing that when we engage with the air regulators, air quality regulators, uh, in, in really meaningful and thoughtful ways, that they are bending over backwards to help us understand and navigate the regulations in a way where we can achieve our objectives. And um, this year, we've added a component to our training exchanges, which is smoke 
uh, more advanced smoke modeling and monitoring. And so we're going to be doing a lot more tracking on how we're impacting the local communities we're burning around, not just through you know photos and ocular estimates, but um, using models and, and um, measuring devices out in the field. And, um, and so we're really looking forward to that. Personally, I'm not concerned that we're going to show that we're having a negative impact on the community. And if we are, then that's going to be really informative and we're going to be able to um, modify our activities so that we have less. So I don't think by having this extra component we're at risk of um, you know, jeopardizing our burn windows. And in fact, I think we're going to improve our relationships with the air regulators and they're going to appreciate our work and, and work more closely with us. Next slide. Developing a cross-trained workforce, I think, Wayne, you mentioned this regarding diversity. It's super exciting when um, a wide variety of people are working together on a single project and they can bring in their um, ideas and experiences and skill sets and share with one another. So um, my background is firefighting and uh, prescribed fire lighting. I'm not a biologist or an ecologist. And I learn so much when I get to work with different scientists, researchers, and um, biologists and land managers out on a fire line. And they're able to help me understand more of what's going on. And then conversely, um, you know, me being able to spend time with them and talking about tactics, control lines, mobilizing resources, and staffing and equipment. I think those kinds of cross-trainings are really important to help the whole community who is promoting prescribed fire to understand um, capabilities and limitations. I think that as we develop a cross-trained workforce, we have to expect to use non-firefighter types, that, um, like biologists, foresters, land stewards, university students, faculty, and more. Um, a program out of um, South Puget Sound in Washington, there, Olympia, Washington, that's been um, ongoing for about eight years now, I think is a, a, a shining example of how a group of biologists got together identified that they were lacking fire and uh, you know, put together a, a program where they brought in just a few outsiders to help them get minimally qualified and to provide them with the minimal qualifications. And over the next eight years, they developed a, um, a very robust prescribed fire program that's burning 50 days out of the year on six different ownerships with about 12 different partner agencies that uh, you know, during a two-month window in the summertime during their burn window on the coast there, um, they're, they, they, they're biologists and foresters and researchers are setting time aside to just go to prescribed fires. And so during that two-month window, every day is a burn day unless it's not, and then you're doing your primary job. But if it's a burn day, you're going to somebody's house or somebody's uh, you know, property or preserve or refuge and um, trying to get fire on the ground. And so in that way, they have almost zero uh, fire-dedicated participants on their burn crew. The only fire dedicated participant on their burn crew is the Washington Department of Natural Resources um, Type 6 engines that are there locally. Everybody else works in a different division besides fire. And so and I think there's a lot of untapped capacity out there from our land managers and scientists and biologists and others. I also think that um, using volunteers, literal uh, community members who are volunteering, I think we have several programs around the country that have been able to utilize non-paid staff on the fire line to increase capacity, and I think those kinds of participants bring a lot of diversity as well. And then this call and this team of people exemplifies some of the um, benefits of in engaging with our municipal fire departments. I think they have a, a lot of capacity. Sometimes um, they have different training standards, and so we have to sync up on that. But, uh, but I think volunteer fire departments and municipal fire departments also have a a lot of untapped capacity. I think as we work with a, a different and diverse um, group of, of fire practitioners and potential fire practitioners, that we do need to provide minimum training and uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, NOMAX, hard hat gloves. Um, because a lot of times what we're seeing is agencies and organizations are not uh, providing training for 
um, non, you know, uh, member employees or, or non-employees of their organization. They believe that there's a certain liability that comes with training somebody up, and so they, they don't, or they don't prioritize their non-employees. And, and so there's a lot of people out there that um, would help, but they haven't been able to get into certain courses, or they, they don't have the $800 it costs to provide PPE. So we've seen programs that have provided the basic training and the basic PPE, uh, they've been able to harvest um, larger workforces to help them out. Next slide. Similarly, I think we need to recognize the role and the expertise of local burners, um, such as the tribes and the ranchers, the hunt clubs, industry. Uh, these are maybe non-firefighting organizations, but have been using fire for potentially generations. And I think they have a lot of local knowledge that um, that can offer up, that they can offer up. One of the lessons learned from the trucks is there that um, not canceling our burns prematurely has really led us to see new and learn about new burn windows. And so I, I think I, I you know have heard some people say that they're you know the only the only way to guarantee you're not going to get a burn done is to just you know not show up to cancel the burn. And I think a lot of times we could look at the weather forecast the night before and we could say, yeah, we're not we're not going to show up. But um, when you know when you have a dedicated crew on site or when you when you um, are, are willing to wait and loiter, you might find burn windows late in the evening or early in the morning, or under conditions that you normally wouldn't burn, but all of a sudden you're burning under them and you're learning that they're um, you know, providing new opportunities and they're uh, treating your fuels effectively. I think all these things happen once we start to, um, you know, spend more time on site or don't cancel prematurely. And I think, um, you know, along with that is that we that we learn that windows are wider than most people believe. I think uh, a lot of us would, would start a conversation with, at my house we have, you know, very few days where we can get our burning done. And, and I, I understand that. But I also think that there's probably twice as many or five times as many days um, to get your burning done if, if you started to look at, at smaller windows or different kinds of opportunities. Investing in a dedicated prescribed fire crew, I, I think this is a holy grail that nobody can afford and very few people are investing in. I wouldn't want to spend much time here because who has the money to do this and is this really an, a viable strategy? But I will say that when we have people dedicated to implementing controlled burns, the controlled burns get done. When we have people who only implement controlled burns as a, as a, as a side part of their job, then you know it's, it's limiting. Even in the best programs, it's still limiting. And so I think if we had more money in, in fuels and fire management for implementing prescribed fire, that we really could start to scale up the uh, use of fire. And then I, I, did, I did put this in there last on purpose. Um, I, I do think this is one of the most important things that we're learning is that when, when your neighbors ask for help, you need to show up um, for multiple reasons. Um, but in a selfish way, if you show up to their house, you know, they'll show up at yours. And, um, and, I, and I really think that, that in, in today's budget climate and the, the way that we're getting work done, that cooperating on controlled burning is most effective, which means that when people call, you got to show up. So um, in a flurry, those are uh, some of the lessons learned from the, from the last 75,000 acres of collaborative burning that we've done. Thanks, Jeremy. That's, that's really inspirational.